Hello, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Since midway through my more than a decade long career teaching Old Norse language sagas, runes, etc. at some of the best universities in the United States, I have shared the best information that I have access to about these subjects on my Patreon supported YouTube channel, which has now become uh, nearly a full-time job thanks to the generosity of those same Patreon supporters and the people who buy my books. I don't spend a lot of time on this channel talking about pop culture, Norse and Viking stuff because frankly I don't engage with it much, don't enjoy engaging with it much, and uh, always kind of regret the occasions on which I'm deputized into the accuracy police. But the Northman movie is so new as I record this a couple days after its release and after I saw it and so many people have asked about it that I thought I would make a video about it just to record some of my initial impressions about it. So what I will do is in the first part of the video I'll talk about some of the well the legitimate medieval sources behind the Northman, uh, some of my impressions about uh, accuracy and authenticity and detail um, as a medievalist. And then in the latter back half of this video, I'll uh, put on more of a movie critic or a more personal hat about it. I am not obviously a movie critic. What I say about movies will never sell or refuse <laughs> you know, any, pro any, any profit to any movie making industry. So, um, you know, I, I'm a, a fairly toothless reviewer here, but for what it's worth from the specialized knowledge that I do have about the subject it purports to present, let's talk about Robert Eggers' The Northman. <laughs> So, like I said, I'm just an average Joe in terms of movie going and such, who sometimes gets wrangled into going to the theater. And what I'm equipped with here are the notes that I took in the dark as I watched this movie. It is uh, it's a very dark movie. Um, seems to be something a lot of movies do is uh, kind of darken things up, I guess, for a dramatic edge. So first of all, as to the basic storyline, there is some basis in the Norse source of Hamlet, the story of Amlev, which uh, is told in uh, the only full form in which it exists from medieval Scandinavia in the Gesta de Norum, or History of the Danes, by medieval Danish writer Saxo Grammaticus, also the name of my ska band. Saxo was purporting to tell the history of prehistoric Denmark, which included many of the myths of the gods who he presents as early human beings who deluded people into worshiping them. Kind of similar to how Snorri Sturluson sometimes talked about them in the prose that are Heimskringla in Iceland. And mixed in, in some of the very earliest chapters, were stories about gods like Odin and Baldr and Thor, who get Latinized names like Othinus and Baldrus and Thoris. He tells stories about the early Danish kings, and among them, he talks about someone he calls Amlevis, which probably reflects a name equivalent to Old West Norse, Old Icelandic, Amlothi, probably something like Amlev in the uh, medieval Danish pronunciation of Saxo. Uh, not Amleth, for what it's worth. The uh, pronunciation in the movie is pretty Latinized. But he tells a story about uh, this, this Amla, who is a Danish prince whose uncle Fengo, just use the Latinized form of these names, kills his father Horvendilis, which is probably Old Norse Arvondil, which is the name of the dad in, in the Northman, and then marries Arvondil's uh, wife, who is called in the Latin text Geruda, it's probably Old Norse Guthrun or, or Gerther, and then uh, many years later, Amleva, after a long period of pretending to be mad, kills him. Now, 
All of that might actually sound a little bit more like Shakespeare's Hamlet than like the Northman, if you've seen the Northman. And it is, the Northman takes kind of this core story about uh, a father named Arvondil, who has a son named Amlido. Uh, Arvondil is called by his brother, who in the movie is called Fjolnir. By the way, Fjolnir is a name of Odin in our mythic material and, and the poetic Edda, the main source of the myths of, of uh, Odin, Thor, and Loki. But in the movie, he's clearly not meant to be Odin because he's a worshiper of a different god, Freyr, who, by the way, side note to a side note, is presented often as a pretty exotic god in the Icelandic sagas, a god of foreigners, and specifically Swedes. Freyr was apparently not a very popular god in Norway or Iceland in the early mid Middle Ages in the Viking Age. So that seems to kind of not comport with uh, this guy being from from Norway, although you could uh, adduce the example of Ravenkill and Ravenkill Saga. Anyway, um, in the movie, he's not, you know, a Danish prince. Uh, he is, I guess, a prince, although the original kingdom was moved to Iceland. And then later, uh, the uncle Fjolnir moves his family and servants to Iceland and establishes a farm there. So we get more of the sort of traditional Icelandic farm setting elements of, of an Icelandic saga like Eagle Saga, Nell Saga, Luxor Saga. All of which I've done some recaps of on this channel if you want to get a taste for what those real Icelandic sagas are like. Uh, there's not a whole ton of plot details otherwise that comport with the Amla the story in Saxo. Um, there are a couple things that seem to me to be shout outs to Hamlet uh, specifically as opposed to Saxo. By the way, you know, spoiler alerts for what it's worth. I assume if you're watching this, you've probably watched the movie. Um, there is a skull of a jester that is a plot point at one point. I mean, this seems like an obvious nod to Yorick. And honestly, probably one of the elements in the movie that I thought was uh, like almost kind of fun and sly. <laughs> Although um, the movie takes itself very, very seriously. There's not a lot of those fun, sly moments. So... It is uh, mostly its own storyline, although there's heavy borrowings from details in real sagas. So, for example, uh, there is an important scene where Amlitha meets a, um, a man who practices Sather, or women's magic. Um, this is actually pretty realistically portrayed, given that the the Saith mother, who I thought, by the way, um, you know, I don't know many Hollywood people's names, but I thought that the actor in this case was uh, d did a really good job with a weird part. I believe he was an Icelandic actor, uh, the judge from his uh, accent, if nothing else. But he uh, he's wearing women's clothes, which is actually very realistic. Um, for a, a practitioner of say they're one of these men who practices this magic that's forbidden to men uh, magic that's focused on uh, divining the future and, and other hidden things anyway this the save mother uh, tells Amlava that he needs to dig into a burial mound and there he will find a sword that he must use to avenge his dad kills uncle with it and there's some details here that really are very evocative of a real Icelandic saga um, not only the sword that's fetched from a burial mound uh, that was made in much older times uh, we find that in real sagas but in the weird conditions of when the sword can be drawn out so for example uh, this sword in particular can only be drawn out uh, I think it was under moonlight or at the gates of hell of course the gates of hell are a plot point in the movie that that really is kind of true to the sagas that 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 this whole scene i think was actually some of the finest saga retelling um because uh for example i want to say it's in cormac saga there's another very old sword uh that's adduced at some point and it has to be treated in a particular way it has a snake inside of of it that you have to treat well and it can only be drawn under certain conditions. Um, in the Saga of Herefor and Haithrek, which I've published a translation of with Hackett Publishing, there's also the sword Tyrving, which is taken out of a burial mound. Notably, the daughter goes and takes it from her zombie dad. I'll get back to that in a minute because it kind of influences the next part of the scene. Um, 
and it can only be drawn if it will, well, it can only be received if it's drawn someone's blood since it was drawn. So those sorts of conditions are, are in fact pretty typical of the sagas and the, uh, the snake that shows up in that scene made me think about the snake in Cormac's saga. So I felt like that scene was really the biggest fan service to medievalists like me, maybe. But then it kind of gets off of the saga track from there. We see Amleth go to this burial mound and in, uh, in, in, in moonlight, he digs into it. He finds a buried chieftain who has the sword and he has a big Hollywood style fight with the chieftain. Um, at the end of this fight, he cuts off the chieftain's head and then stuffs it um, by his anus. This is actually a detail that we see in Fighting the Undead in, uh, at least I believe, uh, the Saga of Gretir. I thought this scene sort of missed a lot of what you would actually see in a saga scene there. The Norse sagas and the Eddas, uh, the, the records of myth, tend not to have these long, uh, what I'll dismissively call Michael Bay uh, fight scenes. Instead, what you'd actually expect is to be a pretty long conversation between Amleva and the dead chieftain. You know, we don't find out that I can recall who the dead chieftain is or who his dad was. The dead chieftain doesn't get to speak any poetry, which we would actually expect of one of these undead beings in his grave in a scene um, like in the All Saga where the undead Gunnar appears or in, uh, as I mentioned before, the Saga of Hervor and Hadric, where when Hervor breaks into her dad's grave to take his ancient magic sword, they have this long rock opera of poetry that they exchange about it. She says, give me the sword. He says, the sword is cursed. Back and forth and back and forth till, till she takes it. Um, there's none of that there. And that to me seemed uh, pretty untrue to how that scene would have played out in, in a saga for what that's worth. Now, uh, <laughs> peeling away from, from the, the uh, Sather and magic sword scene, which is, again, some of the most positive stuff I have to say about the movie from a uh, evoking real medieval literature standpoint. I'm going to turn to my notes from the darkness, which are sometimes pretty, <laughs> pretty hard to read. Right, I was, you know, using a pen without being able to see my, my index card. The runes in the movie are particularly well done. Now, I know very well as someone who has worked as a consultant and <laughs> I'll take this title upon myself, Rune Master for major Hollywood movies and video games and such, that it's not, you know, it's not Robert Eggers or Alexander Scotchgord who did the runes, right? They at least knew to hire the right person. And I believe in this case, it was Hoiker Thorgerson. I believe that the uh, Old Norse experts language and literature experts on the on the scene were Hoiker Thorgerson and uh, Johanna Katrin Friedrichsdotter. And we will actually have an interview on my Patreon channel live on uh, May 1st with Johanna Katrin Friedrichsdotter about her work on this movie. So maybe she'll be able to tell us more about this. But I think, uh, unless I'm wrong, that it was Hoiker Thorgerson who did the runes and he did a very good job, of course. Uh, the runes that you see on the chapter headings of the movie, each the movie is divided into eight, nine, ten, something like that, uh, sort of chapters. Uh, each one is introduced with runes on the screen, which are in younger Futhark, which are the accurate, realistic, Viking Age runic alphabet that would have been used during the time this movie is supposed to take place, which I believe was in the late 800s, maybe to early 900s AD. Uh, that's nice to see. Of course, it's more realistic than the Elder Futhark, which is better known. I'm sure that the movie has taken grief from some people who think that the runes are wrong because they're not Elder Futhark, but actually the, the runes are are th th very good, very accurate. Um, sometimes they don't exactly match up with what the uh, English says on the screen. So for ex example, the first chapter says um, Atlantic Ocean, I think in English, but the runes say Hrapsoi, right? island of the Raven, Raven's Island, which is the island where uh, Amalus' father's kingdom, uh, Alvarez's kingdom is. And then uh, 
the end, the, the very end screen, I think in English says the Northman, right? Just recapitulates the title of the movie, but it says in runes, Amlo the Saga, right? The Saga of Amlo, the, the old Icelandic version of that name, Amlo. So neat little touches if you can read runes. Uh, or the line of the Rus, uh, it says that in English, but then in Old Norse it's Gardariki, which is the Old Norse name for the line of the Rus, the uh, uh, area speaking Old East Norse in Eastern Europe, modern day Ukraine, Russia, where uh, actually I would expect more of the people to speak Old Norse, but whatever. Uh, that's that's a, a minor quibble with the movie, maybe. I'll have a little bit more to say about the runes, some more of the um, accuracy or authenticity details, and then eventually get to my unwanted personal remarks after a quick word in the usual way from my friends and partners at Grim for Musty. <laughs> We've now hit most of the high points and we're uh, descending the mountain a little bit now. So one place where the runes don't make sense is the runes on the magic sword. And the magic sword's name is in uh, reconstructed medieval old Icelandic pronunciation, Dreugr, modern Icelandic pronunciation, Dreugr, which means uh, one of these undead beings, like the one that Amatha fights for. It. The runes on that sword say Dreugr, just to give it the modern Icelandic pronunciation, but they say it in Elder Fruilag runes. This is one place where the runes don't match. It's possible Hoiker Thorgerson didn't do this part. I know for a fact that I've worked on uh, big media projects where you know I'm hired to do the runes, but then everybody thinks because there's rune translators or whatever online that they don't need any special training to do it. So some people do. Uh, some people who don't know what they're doing do other parts. So maybe Hoiker didn't even do this, or maybe the studio required it. Who knows, who cares, but the runes don't make sense because even if the sword is old enough to have been forged in Elder Fruithark times, the language would also have been different at that time. So you wouldn't expect to say Troikar, you expect it to say Proto-Norse Traugas. So that's an anachronism and something that uh, I thought was, uh, could have been done much better. I also had no idea what was going on with the accents in the movie. I was a little bit confused about what they were trying to do. Uh, I guess Anya Taylor-Joy sounded fairly convincing with a sort of Slavic sounding accent, but then you have this whole mix of uh, American and British and Australian and Scandinavian and Icelandic actors, and everyone sort of has a, enough of a different accent that I guess it evokes sort of a sense of a very mixed community, but it also seems like a sort of inconsistent community when people don't sound that much like one another. I thought that Nicole Kidman's uh, drunken Swedo-Scottish accent was particularly odd, but then it turns out she's not even supposed to really be from that area anyway, so maybe it's, I, I don't know. The accents I thought were, were, were odd. Um, could have could have done some, some different choices there. One of my notes from the dark theater just says, where? And um, I often found myself thinking that, where on earth or where in Iceland is this happening? They seem to land somewhere around Viki Myrdal in the southwest, then they seem to trek through somewhere around Mivaden in the northeast, and then they come to the farm of um, Fjolnir somewhere in Iceland, which uh, has an active volcano burning in the distance, because you know, volcanoes are always burning in Iceland. It's a, just something you get used to. It's like how Colorado is always on fire, I guess. Um, I, I just, I didn't quite understand why things were happening, where they were, what the sequence of, you know, I, I, I didn't have a good map in my head of what was going on in the movie. And that included outside of Iceland too. I thought that, uh, Hrapnzoi, the, uh, original Norwegian kingdom of Arvandil seemed huge looking <laughs> for a Norwegian island, uh, especially the vi view of it that we get early in the movie just seem much smaller than the the scenes later on the island would imply. Um, and it didn't look in some ways that Norwegian to me. Probably wasn't filmed in Norway, who knows. Uh, but just, I didn't have a good sense of the map from the movie and, and I would have preferred that. There were a couple places where there were um, quotations from the Poetic Edda, a couple from 
uh, the poem Havamal, which of course has a place close to my heart. I've done an edition of the Old Norse text with an English translation, and of course I translated the whole Poetic Edda much earlier than that. Uh, this is a quote that I think came from Forskirnes, if I'm not remembering this wrong, in the early training sequence of of Amuva, which I have no idea where all that training stuff came from. Very shamanic, uh, didn't evoke much of anything from uh, an old Norse source to me. Anyway, um, I thought it was unfortunate that these translations, and frankly, the dialogue in general, were so old-timey, right? With the mix of all the weird accents, it was also kind of hard for me to understand what people were saying most of the time anyway, and then I have to get over, you know, all of the really old-timey English, right? I would have preferred a little bit more normal-sounding <laughs> English. Uh, you know, yes, the language they were using at the time is old-timey to us. It wasn't old-timey to them. So I don't know why it's necessary to turn it into old-timey-sounding English. Uh, they did do a little bit of uh, what I guess you could almost call hypercorrection in terms of what they were calling some things. Like I noticed that they typically said Valhol or Valhal rather than Valhalla. Certainly truer to the Old Norse form of that word. Pretty sure I caught someone saying Valkyria rather than Valkyrie. Okay, well, you know. I guess it's nice as far as it goes. Um, there was, like, around, the, again, that, that, that training scene early in the movie with Amletha where, like, I guess you could say that there's shout-outs to some Old Norse literature. Like, I guess the dad and his son pretending to be wolves is kind of evocative of something in the saga of the Volsungs. I guess that the son hanging during that time is kind of evocative of something in Havamal, although seems like a bit of an unrealistic part of one's training. Um, there's also all this talk there about, you know, familial blood and these things that seem just a little off. They don't read to me like the way they talk about these things. You know, uh, not to get deep into the weeds about all the accusations people get into about, you know, racism. But if the Norse were racist, they were way more specifically and way more bizarrely racist than anyone commenting on the internet today. Well, I shouldn't say anyone because there's idiots of all stripes on the internet today. But, like, the stuff about, you know, the the, the pure blood of the family and all of that, like, okay, I, it, 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 I don't really read them talking like that in the sagas. I read them talking more like, Oh, his mom is from whatever fjord, and you know those people, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's weirder and more specifically family-oriented, and it's not really this talk about, like, blood, um, but more these sort of traits that are associated with people from particular places or particular parents or something like that. Oh, I dropped one of my cards. What did this one say? Oh, it says Yorick. <laughs> I guess that was from when that skull came up. Um... God, they say Norns of fate a lot. Like, okay, great. Yeah, the Norns are the beings who determine fate. But Norns of fate is a little bit like talking about, you know, the God of God. Which, by the way, would almost match a lot of the dialogue in this movie, which often turns toward the redundant. Um, I will meet you at the gates of hell, then I shall find you there. It's like, yeah, I just said, just said that. <laughs> um, another thing, actually, that I thought was... Uh, scaling away from some of the internet racism stuff is uh, when uh, the slave Anya Taylor-Joy is brought to the Icelandic farm of Fjolnir. Uh, someone talks, I can't remember what context this happened in, uh, about keeping her house white. Now, that actually does reflect the way that uh, skin color is often talked about in the sagas or even the Eddas, where you are sunburned right, or even, or tanned, which can be good if you're a man, uh, for working outdoors, and that's a negative thing for women's beauty. Women are supposed to be sort of pale, it's a high status thing, uh, so, so it's associated with beauty, so they're saying keep this woman who is, you know, more beautiful than your average slave inside to keep her more, more pale, more house white, and that is the context in which people being uh, white or beautiful or, or darker, as in more sunburned, uh, and therefore less attractive because they're working outdoors, comes up in the saga. So that was 
fairly realistic use of that kind of term. Uh, bear wolf, I think, um, uh, is what, um, uh, Alexander Skarsgård Amlova calls himself, uh, when he's in Iceland, I guess that could be sort of a shout out to Beowulf. Um, elsewhere I've seen it claimed this movie has a lot of basis in Beowulf that I really don't see. Um, surely someone will disagree, but I didn't see a whole lot of Beowulf in it. Um, I know, <laughs> one of my notes just says landscapes. Yes, Iceland is beautiful. That's another positive thing for the movie. Uh, there's a couple places where there's supposed to be some sort of Old Norse dialogue. Again, I think this stuff is mostly the work of Hoikar Thorgerson, and the Old Norse is good. I don't know that the actors necessarily always knew what to do with it very well, and I've encountered this in working with Hollywood types too, where there's always sort of that presumption that, oh, I understand what this pronunciation guide that's written, that was written in five minutes means. Um, Alexander Scotch wrote, I thought, at the end, there's a, a place where he's reading some Old Norse. Pronunciation doesn't really match Old Norse very well, doesn't really match modern Icelandic very well. I feel like he was probably using a pronunciation guide that, that maybe he didn't fully understand. Hard to say. Um, and there's actually a few places where the translate, like I can tell what's, what's being said, but the translation on screen in English doesn't really match it, uh, or doesn't match where it's being, be, being said really. I want to say, for example, there's an example where uh, the English on screen says something like, I'll avenge my dad, while he's actually saying, I'm swearing an oath, right? So it's part of the same utterance, but it's not happening in the same order. Whereas it seems to me that you could have actually followed the order of the Icelandic there, and it would have been perfectly natural. There's a scene with the Old Norse saga game, Knotbiker, so... Uh, that literally just means ball game. Some kind of ball game the Norse played. One thing that I thought was kind of untrue to this movie version of it, uh, although it did feature, I guess, the world's strongest man, that's kind of a fun detail for the movie, um, is that they have the game played by slaves and just watched by their masters. Well, the Norse aren't the Aztec, right? Uh, there's, they're, they're not these aren't disposable people who are playing the ball game. It's actually in the sagas where it's played, which it's often a very big part of a um, plot of sagas, like for example, the Saga of Gisli, one of the finest short Icelandic sagas, another one I've done a summary of. Uh, it's, it's actually played by those high status people. And yes, it's rough. Yes, they're hurting one another, but football players are high status and they hurt one another too. So the fact that it was being played by slaves was uh, just off to me in terms of, uh, the spirit of the sagas, if you will. But, you know, that also gets to something where I'm, I'm a language and literature guy, I'm not an archeologist. And most of the people who complain about accuracy on the internet are, well, they're probably not necessarily credentialed archeologists, but they're archeology span buffs more than they are language and literature buffs. Nobody cares about language and literature stuff compared to how many people care about, you know, the physical culture stuff. Does this sword look right? Does this costume look right? All that stuff which frankly, I don't know a lot about, so I'm not commenting about it very much. You would be amazed how in graduate programs about medieval language and literature, at least when I was going through them, how very, very little the language and literature people even know who the archeology span people are and vice versa. The fields really don't cross very much. Yes, we both deal with the past. Yes, at least in the case of me and Indiana Jones, we wear cool hats, but we're not necessarily all that cross-pollinated. That's intellectually unfortunate. I wish we were more. And I've tried to get up more on, on archaeology, but that's been entirely on my own time. It wasn't part of my education. So um, you'll have to turn to somebody else for whether the swords look right or whatever. I mean, I, I just don't know. Uh, but then I'm not a reenactor or anything like that. I, I just, I, this stuff eludes me. Um, however, I am a bird person, and I took a note <laughs> to myself uh, about all the ravens that we see at night. Yeah, a raven's not a, not a notably nocturnal bird, <laughs> right? It was just a little strange to me as a bird person to see all these ravens around at night. Like ravens are hanging out in the trees at night or, you know, on the rocks. They're, they're not flying around where they can damage their wings. Oh, uh, what else did I write? All right. Yeah, this is a nice uh, concluding remark for my comments about accuracy and such and transition to my personal remarks. I wrote to myself right after the movie on one of these cards, to ask me how accurate a movie is, is like asking me how the weather is in the United States. Exactly. 
if you ask me if the movie is accurate or not, what does that mean? It's like asking me what the weather is in the United States. Um, I can tell you that it's raining, which might well be true in Houston, Texas at any given time, but is pretty unlikely to be true in Jamestown, Colorado, even though at this moment it's snowing lightly. Uh, but if I say it's snowing lightly in Jamestown, Colorado, sure as hell is it in Houston, I can tell you that. And it probably won't be snowing lightly in an hour. And if it's raining in Houston, it might not be in an hour. So the weather in the United States is a really amorphous, big question to ask me that I can't answer you satisfactorily and whether the movie is accurate or not in the same way, you know, maybe a sword or whatever looks very good at the same time that someone is saying something that doesn't very realistically match medieval saga dialogue. Or, you know, 10 minutes later, we have a sword that doesn't look very good. Not that I would be able to call that kind of thing, but the, the language is done uh, very well. Again, probably with credits to Hoyker Thorgerson. Um, I guess my impression is that a lot of research went into the movie. Sure, I'll give him credit for that. Uh, I feel like, however, it was research mostly calculated to get the favor of a crowd that's often loud on the internet, as many small crowds often are, that demands, you know, perfect period of reproductions of clothing and swords and stuff like this, because people want to be transported to another time and place. Now, to me, as one of these few people who really cares about language, that's a bigger part of my transportation to anywhere, right? You know, um, there's probably a million people who can tell you exactly what decade a sword was made in for every one of me, but I guess at least I could go back to this time period and talk to these people before they killed me for my weird clothes and accent. Um, but I don't, I'm not a big movie person in general, and I'm not looking to be transported back to the Viking Age, right? That doesn't sound pleasant to me. Um, I just, I, you know, the 21st century has a whole ton of faults, but I'm sure that I'm better adapted to living in it, even as an idiot who decided to study Old Norse in grad school, um, than I would be any other time. And I just don't find myself wanting to, to, to go back there. And I feel like the movie is often trying to appeal more to that crowd. And as it's doing that, it's sort of losing someone like me who's very interested in this time period, but doesn't dress like a Viking and doesn't think of himself as a modern day Viking or, or, or something like that. Um, I think that our culture is sort of obsessed with these experiential movie experiences now and TV experiences now. You know, I often felt like I was watching something like The Game of Thrones, um, not just because there's a lot of nudity, and believe me, often very unwanted nudity, <laughs> uh, but just this this sense that, you know, like the Lord of the Rings movies or something, or the, or the Game of Thrones, they're, they're trying to make an experience that you want to immerse yourself in, and I am a person who, wants to live in the real world and when I go to the movies I want the movie to wink at me occasionally and say you know uh, we're having fun together right you know one of my favorite movies I'm not sure I can tell you what my favorite movie is I, I, I'm not sure that I have a satisfactory answer to that but certainly one of my very favorite movies is Tombstone right deals with some serious themes um, doesn't require me to put on my you know accuracy police hat because nobody expects me to police the accuracy of an old west movie even though i could probably do that fairly well it's and it's having fun you know there's all this great hilarious memorable dialogue you know there's action uh there's good stunts the stunts are actually being done by people it's not cg by the way i found the cg of the north man often a little unbelievable especially with the fox and what the hell's with him like psychically controlling dogs or something i, I don't know so you know i'm sitting here through the whole movie thinking i i see what experience i'm being expected to have and I'm just not the person who can have that experience, right? For one thing, I'm, uh, I'm not someone who's enchanted with the Middle Ages, which people then go and say, well, then why do you talk about the Middle Ages? Well, I'm enchanted in a different way. I want to know about it. Watching this movie, I don't think helped me know about it per se, at least not in a sense that's meaningful to me. There's a lot of places where 
a turn in the dialogue or something just didn't feel medieval no matter how old-fashioned it was. There's not enough of just the bizarre, unmodern way of thinking that goes into so much of medieval dialogue and even medieval action scenes. You know, I think to a modern audience, often bizarre has to mean spooky. Medieval literature isn't necessarily spooky, although it can be. And of course, Robert Eggers is a very, the, the director of The Northman, very accomplished uh, maker of spooky. I mean, all you have to do is see The Witch, which is a really spooky movie. And perhaps as a control experiment, if that movie is a lot like The Northman, I would actually say it's sort of like The Northman. Um, and maybe my, my negative remarks about The Northman are conditioned by the fact that I sort of go into all Viking movies expecting to hate them. Um, whereas I don't go into movies about colonial Massachusetts expecting to hate them. <sighs> you know, if you think about other movies that I like, uh, single action revolvers are often a major part, right? The Searchers, The Outlaw, Jersey Wales, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, True Grit. Honestly, the newer one's better than the John Wayne one, I, I have to admit. Oh my god. I insulted John Wayne and his ghost knocked down my tripod. <laughs> what, what sacrifice do I make to the ghost of John Wayne? I'll say this, the greatest movie scene in all time is the end of The Searchers. Forgive me, John Wayne. Oh my god. All right, I've rambled too long. I'm glad that I made this video a couple days after I saw the movie. I saw the movie on Saturday, April 23rd, 2022, and it's now Monday, April 25th, 2022, if I'm doing my math right. It's not what my PhD's in. Um, and, you know, I think initially I, I, I would have made a grimmer video about this. And believe me, it's a grim movie. The movie is not have fun. I, I didn't feel like anybody on set was having fun. Maybe the people who animated the foxes and the ravens, actually, that probably those people probably had fun, I would I would suspect. But it just so dour, so so mean. And I know that sounds stupid, but like I, I've I've seen the movie complimented for not catering to 21st century morality, and believe me it doesn't. Um, it's definitely uh, uh, morally, if you will, a uh, 9th or 10th century movie. But, like, even there, it's not necessarily believably morally in that universe. I mean, the whole burning a house full of women and children seems untrue to the Dranger spirit to me. By the way, I did not ever hear the word Dranger, the ultimate compliment for a Viking, come up in this movie, and I kept expecting it because I was going to sue. That's my word in English. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but it just didn't seem that true to it. Like, okay, we understand that people will kill people who aren't in their families and not necessarily feel bad about it, but this is still extreme, <laughs> right? There's probably some people in any given time and any given culture who are that kind of psychopath, but I'm not sure that even a very hyper-martial society like the Vikings would approve of it because it's still a hyper-masculine society and often part of your masculine code of ethics, which, uh, you know, I'm not saying that as a negative, but as a descriptive term, I, uh, these masculine codes of ethics are often what keep kept these societies going for a long time, uh, emphasize honor in fighting opponents who are actually matched to you. And obviously burning women and children inside of a house is not that. Um, you know, even if we have to have our Vikings burning people inside of a house, we would expect them to do something like an Eagle Saga and shout out, you know, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little scene from Eagle Saga. Eagle um, has actually been enslaved in one of his Viking raids. He's, he's, he was out slaving in the Baltic, in modern day Lithuania or Latvia. Gets captured himself by these, these Balts and um, escapes while they're feasting and celebrating their, their big win over the Vikings. Well, he steals 
his weapons back, free some other Vikings, and they're heading to some Viking ships when Akel stops in the middle of the woods on his way out and says, you know what, I feel bad about this, right? I feel, I feel morally wrong. Um, I've done something morally wrong. I've stolen from these people and they don't even know my name. Right now that, again, it's not spooky, but it's bizarre. That's a real 9th or 10th century moral thing that just doesn't compute very well with 21st century morals or ethics, I guess. So he runs back to the farmstead where the Balts are partying, barricades them inside of their house and burns it down. But before he does that, he makes sure they know that his name is Egil Scala Crimson. That's a little more real saga to me. And by the way, the, the whole saga of Egil, which would make a great movie, um, surely someone with some influence will make a movie about that someday and um, give no credit to the videos of mine that perhaps help them understand it better. Uh, anyway, that movie is, that, that book is not a story that glorifies Egil exactly. Right, Egil is a, a Viking of uh, poor moral character, not just from a medieval Christian or uh, post-Christian 21st century world's perspective, but even in a Viking age perspective. Egil is a jerk. Um, he does things that are not that are that are not considered correct or prudent. But his story is so much more of a... Now, here's the next, like, cool thing that happens to Egil. There's a lot of humor in the story. Um, if the Northman had been more like that, I would have liked it better. Instead, again, I feel like it's catering to this audience that wants to be Vikings, wants to inhabit that world, wants a sense of separation from the 21st century, but... Still, it's made by people who can't separate themselves in ways that don't ultimately kind of cater to a 21st century shock value or a 21st century desire for spookiness. I mean, look at all the podcasts that are most popular now. Not to say that I don't enjoy the last podcast on the Left Cult episode. Those are pretty funny. But, uh, you know, these we, our time is, is often obsessed with murder and brutality in a way that's a little creepy. And I think that transferring that obsession to a time that was truly violent, but also still human, is, uh, is foreign to me. So, I wouldn't pay to watch the movie again, and I wouldn't watch the movie again for free. But I watched it because I knew my audience would have questions about it, and I wanted to be able to ask good questions to Johanna Katrin Friedrichsdotter. The two people still listening. I hope your Patreon supporters who will join us for that interview on May 1st. And, you know, yes, I know that there's probably some some bitterness that, that sounds like it comes through even in, uh, in a video that's much less grim than I originally intended to make about this, this movie. Because, uh, you know, you could attribute it to something like jealousy. I know that even a movie that totally bombed at the box office would have a greater influence on people's understanding of Norse mythology in the Viking Age for an entire century than I'll have, uh, certainly while alive, and even more certainly once I'm declared an unidentified, unclaimed corpse by the Fremont County Wyoming Coroner's Office. Hi, Larry. So there's a little bit of that, that, that jealousy that says, you know, great, I uh, freaking indentured myself to learn as much as I could about this time period never got sucked into believing that I lived in it um, and just don't have the influence of someone who can do the research, which means nothing like what someone like me means by do the research. You know, and, and that's the person who gets to influence the narrative about it, right? I'm going to be forgotten and this movie is going to be is, is less forgotten. <laughs> Although ultimately, of course, everything is. Well, that's my... Slightly grim, but I hope slightly informative take on the North Man. All right, from beautiful Colorado, I assure you, whether you loved the movie or hated it or something in between like me, I'm wishing you all the best.